He was a man in total confusion. <laughs> Cardini was, probably of all of us, I think Cardini was the greatest technician. He was born in Mumbles, just outside Swansea. Got caught up at a very young age in the maelstrom of the First World War. Was twice injured in the trenches. It was during that period that the pack of cards, which every soldier was allowed to carry, became his sanity. He knew a little bit about magic, and he started to develop manipulation in the trenches. Uh, so cold it was, he asked for gloves to wear while he was performing his manipulations, which enabled him to develop the greatest sensitivity that one could possibly imagine. Cardini combined brilliant technical skill with a unique stage persona that delighted his audience. Magicians refer to this as patter, even when not a word is spoken. The patter infills the ground. It's the music of close-up. Second one, second look, one, s'il vous plaît. Un, deux, trois, one, two, and one, three, one down, one up. Brrrr, gali gali, up the two down, s'il vous plaît, tous les deux en bas, oui. I'm more concerned with the personality than the magic itself. I think magic is about a magician, not about tricks or not about effects. But the, the, the idea of the trick is this. Here's the glass, here's the bottle. Here's the bottle, here's the glass. The and sometimes the patter is more important than the magic. <laughs> they have now changed places. Tommy Cooper used to take the mickey out of it, something terrible, didn't he, you know, and a, and a cover of a ball cup. People say about people like Les Dawson, hey, to play the piano, that bad, he must be a good pianist. <laughs> well, no, he wasn't. And like Tommy, he, he must have been a great magician to do that. Well, he wasn't. He was a competent, average, magic club magician. He was the greatest clown on earth at the time. In complete contrast to Tommy Cooper's endearing comic incompetent, Channing Pollock's stage persona was sexy and sophisticated. In tune with the New York 1950s cabaret settings, he was booked to appear in. I had purchased a, a dove. It was way back in 1947 or 48. I meant to buy a rabbit, but I ended up buying a dove. and. Uh, there was something about that prop that was more alive and animated than a, a playing card or uh, other objects. The act was just so simple and direct, and there was no futzing around. I mean, he just came out and just started doing real magic. What I managed to do was incorporate the working with these doves along with the manipulation. It didn't require any words. It was uh, self-evident and uh, all visual. He wasn't a demonstrative performer. He seemed sort of, you know, detached on stage. There was a dark romanticism to his magic. The use of the dove, the symbolism of the dove. The blood red silk handkerchiefs, which were a motif throughout the act. But he also had this sort of aura about him, this very mysterious aura. I don't think he was trying to be mysterious. I think he was just being himself. He just had some sort of magical quality. 
I developed a certain aloofness on stage. Uh, some people might call it sophistication, but uh, it really came about uh, out of sheer fright. I was kind of frightened uh, when I first went to New York to appear in cabaret, and I developed this attitude. <laughs> it seemed to be the. <laughs> It seemed to work. My goal when I started was I wanted to be Channing Pollock. I wanted to do uh, magic with the doves. So he was a, an idol of mine. Nowadays, Lance Burton is one of the highest paid stage magicians in the world, with his own Las Vegas theater and a street in the city named after him. And you know, my goal is the same today. I look at Channing today and I go, that's what I want to be when I get to that age, because he's just still the coolest guy uh, in the world. Today, the Lance Burton show in Las Vegas is booked up for years to come. But other close-up magic performers have found their natural home in television, the entertainment revolution of the 20th century. TV killed off the dying embers of vaudeville and music hall, but provided a whole new platform for magicians, or for those who could adapt to it. This is a very quick one with a, with a handkerchief, with Savannah's handkerchief. You twist it into a, a sort of a rope like this. Have you ever tried to tie a knot in this, Savannah? Do you tie a knot in it? It just doesn't, you see. You tie it like that and you pull it and it, it's a sort of knot that isn't. David Nixon was the first famous British magician on TV, so he's a huge influence on people like myself and Paul Daniels and all the rest of them. And what was, I mean, I suppose the one word that springs to mind is charm. He was a charming man. He was your, like, your, your nice uncle who did, uh, you know, tricks at a wedding reception. And uh, what was nice about him, he kind of like, he'd been a cabaret magician. There's this whole period where close-up kind of married together with stage magic and theatre magic, so you were doing small-scale tricks with everyday objects but on a stage and he kind of brought that to TV so he used the TV medium much in the way that he'd use a cabaret room. Lady Doctor, may I please borrow your wrist for a moment, your left wrist perhaps? May I? You don't mind? Thank you very much indeed. I'll be very careful of that. <laughs> David Nixon's genteel presentation and intimate close-up magic was ideal for the times. All the family could safely gather and watch. Circulation on it, that's not too tight, is it? Would you be kind enough just to hold my hand? This is the best part of the trick. The idea is to try <coughs> and pull the handkerchief through your wrist without undoing the knot and without actually severing the hand from the body, you see. Now, are you ready? Ready? That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Close-up magic perpetuated its image as safe, polite entertainment for more than 30 I'm years. Stuck in here, I know. OK, now, you can tie another one at the top. I don't care. Tie uh -huh. another one. Just to make sure, no? To be sure. Good? Oh, boy. Now, how many not you can to here now? It's two. Two? Two, yes. Well, anyway, you hold this in the hand. He doesn't believe it. I mean, I don't do it. <laughs> but by ignoring the changing times, close-up magic had become dull, and younger audiences lost interest. Close-up magic wasn't working as well as it could have on... Uh, television that you know anybody that performs in the real world and sees the reactions that this gets in the real world can understand that what was being done on television at the time wasn't duplicating those responses in fact it might be said that it's only recently with David Blaine that uh, the public themselves have started to talk about the medium of close-up any card that you want you can have right it's fair to say here we go watch take one out Take one. Don't let me see it. Which one? That special moment so of the magic the being done before your very eyes. Here, take the deck. Mix it into the deck. Mix it up into the deck. We still carry a, a huge memory of how wonderful David Blaine is at street magic. On the other side of the glass. <laughs> Give me a quarter. I got a quarter right here. You know how people change the consistency of metals? No. What? How people change?